uh, last presentation of uh, today. Um, so thank you very much. Let's see if I manage. Okay, so I hope you can see the, the presentation. Yep, that's great. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So thank you very much for sticking around until the uh, until the end. So this is not going to be uh, it's serious, of course, but I'm basically just throwing a couple of, of news um, at you that have accumulated over the last year or so. Um, just to give a rough idea, so a couple of new resins too uh, this time. Um, a couple of updates on methods and applications, quite various, a bit of Ratifarma, a little bit of Radioanalytical. So really just some, some, some small updates. Uh, an idea what should be coming up next year looks like this is actually really going to uh, to happen. So that should fit. Um, a couple of new resins, some other stuff. Um, something that you might have seen on uh, done a press release on that. A collaboration we have with the local university, just a couple of words. And then some other ongoing projects, as usual, with the aim to, well, to give an idea what's interesting for us and then see if if uh, any of these topics is interesting for you, as I said, we are constantly looking for new uh, collaborations and we very much like entering into collaborations, especially R&D wise. So in terms of new resins, uh, I, there's really not much I, I need to say about that. Alex has been giving a very, very nice and very thorough uh, overview over that. So indeed, uh, we've been following the, uh, the, the work on plastics and leather beads that I impregnated with selective actants, extractants in some time. So yeah, again, uh, work's been done at the University of Barcelona. Um, and so we have a first resin, that's the TKTC and there's going to be uh, some more. Um, so this one is on Honeyquad 336 space, uh, mostly Tech 99, but as Alex has shown, there's a couple of other, other things you can probably do with that. Um, we are interested in, in some of the others. So uh, as, as he said, um, TK101 already for lead separation. Uh, strontium is going to be of interest. Uh, the work on actinium is quite uh, quite interesting for cross alpha measurements. Um, so again, some applications in the environment monitoring, uh, emergency situations, decommissioning. Um, so rather rapid separations, easy separations, easy to uh, to automate. Uh, but I think also again, um, application in, in the QC, the determination of radionuclidic uh, impurities of a radiopharmaceutical uh, radionuclide, especially. If there's no gamma spectrometry available, I think the strontium uh, resin version to look into strontium 90 and yttrium 90 product, for example, could be quite could be a quite interesting application. So that's some some kind of stuff that we're going to continue looking into, and to continue working with them. And again, the the, the nice part in a way is you keep the the your product your your, your product your your analyte on the cartridge, use the cartridge, put it directly into an LSC counter in an LSC vial. Um, so it has no illusion, there's no evaporation, early quoting. Um, so optimization is, is, is quite facile. And again, in terms of, of uh, even radio, radiation protection, um, keeping that steps at bay, especially for high activity samples, is, is uh, something we would consider something like an advantage. Indeed, chemical yield is, is a whole topic, quite easy for technetium, um, for the plutonium and for the polonium. That's Indeed, something that you really have to to, to look into quite quite thoroughly. So that's uh, that's the first one. Um, the second one, that's actually Ben has, has been giving a great overview over that already. Uh, TK202. Uh, it's really something we had questions on for for quite some time. So uh, at some point we went for that. It's indeed it's a pack which is crafted on inner support ACOS biphasic system. And as already explained by uh, by Ben, it's basically what you want to have a high concentration of cosmotrophic anions. In our case, uh, most important is, is indeed uh, molybdate and hydroxide. Um, in some applications, actually using carbonate might be of interest. There's been work on that uh, in, in the past, but really for us, most important is the hydroxide and the, and the molybdate. So the latter that the, the molybdate is actually really pushing the, the, the retention of the technetium is very helpful. And we're going to see that later when working with fairly large molybdenum targets, for example. So as already discussed, um, in the, the sodium hydroxide concentration, ideally five to seven. So that's a that's a good 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 region. And um, you can basically, I mean, there's a limit at some point. But adding more molybdenum, as long as it's molybdate, 
is actually something that is quite helpful for the uh, for the retention. Um, again, as uh, as shown, so some of the applications really alkaline fusion um, decommissioning samples. Um, that's something that's already under the beta testing. Let's say the main work has been done on the soft molybdenum targets. Uh, get back to that a little bit later. Um, generally, quite quite selective system. Um, not too many other elements. Uh, retained under these uh, these conditions on that resin, you need to be, pay attention a little bit to to other calcropic anions, uh, especially iodide, for example. So uh, that's something that if you have iodide in your sample, which is probably not that much of a problem in after an alkaline fusion, um, uh, if there is, you might need to take uh, some uh, some precautions with that. Uh, that's a couple of ideas on how to do that already. So uranium, in terms of chemistry. It's reasonably close, uh, as you can see in the, uh, the upper right uh, graph. So um, very similar. You can keep use that as a sort of standard. Illusion water. What's quite important? The, the, the water. So in a small volume, the, the resin itself is still full with uh, hydroxide. So the, the water that the, the fraction that you will will retain uh, elute is isn't really water. Uh, it's still quite quite alkaline, which is a problem for some applications, especially if you're looking more in the medical. Uh, type of uh, of application, so um, a quite quite typical way of doing, dealing with that is just taking that going through cation exchanger to to neutralize and even even acidify a little bit, uh, take out sodium, which is uh, being problematic for the next step otherwise, and then you can elute on a aluminum oxide, very very classical chemistry, uh, to remove uh, trace molybdenum. Fairly good guess that iodide, for example, would go through too. Uh, technetium is collected on the on the aluminum oxide. And it's then diluted in, in a fairly small volume in 0.9% uh, sodium chloride solution. So this is really the, the very, uh, very, very old school at the end of the day, uh, technetium chemistry, as you know that from the, uh, the technetium generators. But then it has uh, just been working for a long time and it's working very, uh, very nicely. So um, you do get a very small volume in the sodium chloride solution if that's something that uh, is helpful for you. Otherwise, you can stop before that and just take the neutralized uh, sample. So that's uh, an overview uh, that's really very, very close to the method by Bernard uh, by Zeisler. So the, the Triumph group um, for the separation of tech 99 m uh, from monotenum targets. That's again getting a bit back to, to Ben presentation, although uh, the, the, the actual technician is, is different. I don't really want to go through it. That's really something you should look at at uh, at home with a little more more time but so there's a there's a, like a separation scheme uh, that if you follow uh, you will get a tech 99 m in uh, m or m depending on, uh, on the type of sample uh, that you can then uh, use either for analytical purpose or for other purpose um so one of the, the applications obviously you've been looking into um but preparing really we don't have a cyclotron so we can only do the, the work cold. Uh, so all of this work has been done with, with rhenium. Uh, equivalent of two gram of molybdenum, uh, two microgram of rhenium. Uh, separation using fairly small cartridges, two mil uh, TK202, uh, C8. Something that's coming up quite often. Usually the, the size of the cation exchanger is pretty much the same than the, the, the TK202 cartridge to show having enough capacity in a way to neutralize and more than neutralize uh, the solution, take out uh, the sodium, so you need a fairly large uh, cut cut exchange cartridge, and then the uh, the aluminum oxide cartridge. After that, it's usually much smaller. That's what you want. You want to concentrate the technetium on that, then dilute in as small volume as, as possible. So if you apply the uh, the method described by by Zeisler, uh, using TK2, uh, you do get a very high product, high purity product, um, chemical yield above ninety percent usually, and in a, in a fairly small uh, volume. So overall, the, the TK202 seems to be quite, quite well uh, suitable for that application. Uh, and that's really something that is uh, being under testing and partially, although to, for different technetium uh, with, with uh, the guys from NPL. A um, bit more challenging. Uh, one of the questions that we tend to get from time to time is, is tech 99 m from fairly large molybdenum targets that are not, in that case, uh, irradiated in a, in a cyclotron. This is, uh, this reactor uh, stuff, so uh, neutron activation in a way. Um, possible too, you need a bit of it, way larger column. 
about 160 mil. So I think it's something we can still optimize a little bit, but you need a fairly, uh, fairly big column to deal with the, the very large amount of, of molybdenum and the very large amount of, of liquid. I mean, dissolving 200 gram of uh, molybdenum is, or even molybdenum oxide uh, equivalent, it's going to, to end up in a, in a volume that is, uh, that's fairly large. So you need a column that's, that's of a, a sufficient size to, to retain the, the technetium at the end of the day. So can six or seven molar sodium hydroxide dilution in water. Then the, uh, the, the next steps are really quite, quite the same. Go through the eighth uh, cartridge or column, same size approximately, remove the hydroxide and the sodium. And then in this case, in that example, uh, go on to a final aluminum oxide cartridge, uh, eight milliliter. So basically you recover your product in, in something in the, in the area of about 20 mil, uh, while starting at something that's probably higher than, than uh, three liters. So the, the, the concentration factor is also quite, quite good. And the, the purity of the product, especially also due to the fact that there's the additional aluminum oxide step at the end of the day um, is, uh, is very good. And that's something that's going into better testing um, right now. Okay, so that's the new residents, no uh, new applications. Um, I'm happy about this one. That's been one of our white whales in a, in a way. Uh, we've been trying to, to combine uh, TK201 and Copperas in one method uh, since, since quite a long time, never really worked. Uh, it really did the breakthrough in the way it's a publication by, by the G group, by uh, Johan and, and Katie, uh, that introduced, as she, she states, and that that's true, but nobody thought about it before, um, a, a rinsing step that is actually low acid and high sodium chloride. On the ticket to one, if, you, if you're separating copper 64, the step is really allowing you to recover the copper 64 really in, in a very dilute HDL very reproducibly. So very important for the uh, for the asset management. The TK201 is a little bit like a, an acid sponge in a way. It's not releasing the acid easily. So uh, using the sodium chloride instead of acid for one of the rinsing steps is really helping a lot. And that was really a key step to allow us to uh, to, to finally uh, get something running that's a, a TK201 uh, CU resin method, which at the end of the day might be something like a very a bit of the Rolls Royce maybe. Uh, copper 64 um, purity uh, method. Uh, so starting with the two milliliter of TK201 for the conversion uh, and matrix removal, so nickel passing through. Uh, other than for, for the work from, from, uh, from GE, no TVP needed. The, the final purification is done on the copper resin, especially with respect to, uh, to iron gallium. Um, then that's something we really had a, lot, a hard, hard time getting to work before. Copper can then be looted in the acetate buffer. Um, that is important as if you want to load the copper resin, you really need to be at something like pH three. Um, so you really need to manage the, the your acid concentration of the elution step very well. Um, so take that, uh, learn load it onto a, um, a one liter copper resin cartridge for, for final for additional purification. So that really takes care of, uh, of all of the other elements that might still be there. And then, a bit Babushka style, uh, uh, another small cartridge. So either at that state, uh, you loot six more HL, evaporate and uh, redissolve. If you want to keep it completely optimized, uh, you might want to look into using a 0.3 milliliter uh, to get to a one, uh, again for conversion and also concentration. So that should get you a, a final product, high purity in a very, very small volume. So proof of principle is okay. Uh, now we need to look into optimizing the volumes a little bit, but if that is something that's of interest for any of you, we uh, very happily uh, share the, method, the draft method and uh, the cartridges that that forward it. Um, a couple of other separations, TK200. Um, something we had a couple of times, questions on palladium separation from a rhodium target. Um, so that's something we had to deal with. And it's really the target solution is the the most tricky part in a way. Um, so again, uh, somebody else had, had to work on that. So we've been given to understand that, uh, that fairly high sulfuric acid is as good as, good as it gets for, for the solution of the, the rhodium target. So in order to have a method that's actually extracting the, the, the palladium from something like well, fairly high sulfuric acid. But on the other hand, the final product should be very free of, of, of sulfate. Uh, so needed some kind of rinsing step in between. So TK200 was, was actually a fairly good choice for that. Um, 
loading from uh, 8 molar sulfuric acid works very well. Uh, rhodium starts to break through. Uh, palladium is well retained. Um, last traces of the uh, of the rhodium are removed with 2 molar HCl together with uh, sulfuric acid. Uh, small rinse with water. That's just something we like to do to, to lower the acid concentration a bit. And then in that special request, uh, illusion was requested to be in, in uh, sodium acetate. Um, there are probably better ways, but that's really something we need to look into uh, still. But acetate is something that's working. It's actually a request we get uh, more and more often uh, to actually elute the, uh, the cartridges directly with a buffer solution to, well, not in this case, but general cases to, uh, to facilitate uh, the labeling. Another thing on the TK200 that we've been working on some, some time, um, platinum separation from iridium. Again, if you have the oxidation sets right, the separation itself on TK200 is, is, is quite, uh, it's quite, quite easy, but oxidation state control is, is, is key. Um, I've seen there a nice publication from, uh, from Obata et al., uh, Chiba, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they've been working on uh, obtaining um, radioactive cisplatin. Um, they've actually been using rather TPP uh, based method and then onion exchange for a final uh, purification. So three TBP cutters, which work very, very fine at very high uh, chemical yields. But again, um, oxidation state control in that system is uh, is quite key. But uh, yeah, very nice publication, very good work actually from, from the group. Uh, actually, not so much new here. We were pretty much sticking to our, our usual method in a way, uh, germanium 68 separation from gallium nickel or gallium uh, cobalt targets. Uh, so that the method itself, as, as we see it, it's, it's probably the most suitable uh, and has been tested cold, and hot to a certain extent. Um, there's, well, first cycle on zirconium resin, two milliliter cartridge, even for uh, multi-crumb um, targets. That's working very nicely, actually. Illusion and citric acid, that's something you need to do very slowly. So the kinetics are not great. That's something that's taken a little bit of time. Um, we acidify to uh, five molar sulfuric acid, a lot on the smaller zirconium cart uh, cartridge. Again, rinse with uh, five molar sulfuric. Try to get off as much acid as possible, vacuum or, or, or nitrogen. Uh, again, dilute in citric acid. So that gives a very, very high purity product. Very happy about it. But the thing is, citric acid is not something that's acceptable as a final product. So then uh, we go into a, a conversion step. There's a couple of possibilities. A pre filter is used. TK400 look to be something that's, that's working too. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the best suitable the resin we found is Istigard uh, resin. Um, what you need to do is you need to certify to Neumolar HCl, uh, then load to the guard resin. Uh, germanium is, is retained. And one of the differences, for example, to, to, to the pre-filter resin is you do have an addition, very high actually, selectivity of the guard resin for the germanium. Uh, so it can rinse off if there would be any last impurities of, of gallium, you can rinse them off, same for nickel or cobalt, uh, and then elute in 0.05 in HCl. Here, the challenge again is rather more to control the pH of, uh, of your final product. It's just one thing that's very important. Um, so this was working very nicely for with the standard cartridge, the cartridge, cartridge for let's say low amounts of, um, of, uh, of, of germanium. But once the testing went into like a more serious phase with the amount of germanium, 68 actually became more important. It showed that it's extremely important before using the card resin in that step, you definitely need to rinse it with ethanol uh, then with water, but the, the, the rinsing with ethanol is just really key. We're still trying to figure out what exactly is this happening, if there's any monomers left on the, on the surface, or if it's really a question of uh, very hydrophobic and you need to open up these sites by using some kind of intermediate uh, solvent. But this, this has, to, has proven to be key if you want to go for large scale germanium 68 um, production. So, while we've had the germanium, actually been a, quite a bit of work on germanium uh, last couple of months. Uh, so, one is uh, removal. Uh, that's something uh, that we've been using with a, a CMOXI pan that turned out to be, in terms of removal and, and germanium retention, well, better at the end of the day, ten oxides or titanium oxides. Um, we've been sending a couple of beta testing samples around the name of TKG RAM for germanium removal. So we'll see, but it's a flashy name. Um, from what we've seen, germanium is really 
well extracted from dilute acid with tested seawater. That worked very well too, actually. So um, very high retention of the germanium. Um, so the main application is going to be decontamination of waste. Um, not entirely sure. It might be a question of a, of contaminated uh, waste tank in a, in a nuclear medicine department. It's quite possible. Most of the applications right now would be much closer to the uh, to, to the person that's actually using um, the uh, the to do the labeling, who's doing the uh, the actual work with the, the generator. So probably uh, rather waste treatment, pretty much online or directly to the local waste that is close to the, to the labeling. Um, there's been some discussion on testing that to, to eliminate germ germanium 68 breakthrough from generator affluence. So that's something that needs to be to be seen. The, uh, the resin itself shows no selectivity for gallium. So that's something that might actually work, but it's probably a question that's, as to the quality of the germanium generators is, is getting better and better. It's probably going to uh, to disappear at some point. So I think really the waste treatment is, is the more more interesting application at the end of the day. Um, yeah, a couple of fancy uh, other questions that we again got a couple of times. So uh, how how to combine uh, the effluents from several germanium generators? So if you want to combine the gallium sixty eight from several generators, how to, how to do? Basically, we've been testing two two approaches. One is actually just using the uh, that the general, in a way, uh, gallium-68 um, chemistry using ZRS and TK200. So just dilute from the generator onto ZR, concentrate, go to TK200 uh, to elute in uh, whatever, actually, uh, dilute acid or even water or buffer solution. So that that's a, a very, that's something that's working very well, actually. Um, the other option is you just dilute several, you acidify, I did like one mole or 1.5 mole HCl, and then load on TK200. Uh, um, that is a bit faster, probably. You will have less impurity removal. That's something that that Zirconius is, is going to to bring into the game. That is going to help you to further clean up the, the gallium 68 if, if needed. Um, but then this one is probably going to be a bit bit faster. And again, illusion in dilute HCl or water or, or a buffer solution. Uh, another question on germanium that's, that might make a lot of sense is uh, is there any way to recycle the uh, generators actually and and the, the real the, the complicated part is is to get the germanium 68 out of the uh, the generator support um we've been playing around with using uh, 9 mole hcl which seems to work to a certain extent but again this was cold cold test with uh, a tin oxide or tin oxide that was uh, loaded with germanium so hard to say if that's really Something that's um, that's really realistically uh, realistic for for what's happening in the real real life. Um, so the um, uh, what we've seen is, I mean, in our case, we can elute the germanium quite nicely, so that's that, that's okay. We do attack the support quite strongly. So what you get is is a solution that yeah contains germanium, but it contains vast amount of titanium or tin, depending on what you're testing. Um, so basically, to, to take care of that, uh, again, card resin worked very, very nicely, uh, and you're in 9 molar HCl anyway, so just basically uh, load through first, elute and dilute HCl, we have certify go through second cartridge, uh, and we found that this is uh, having a high chemical yield, and the decontamination from, from stuff like tin or, or titanium has really, uh, been really quite, quite nice, actually. So that's something um, that we're definitely going to follow up on. I can keep that one uh, fairly uh, fairly short. I've been talking about that uh, last year already. Uh, I mean, obviously, in, in nuclear medicine, and lutetium, and that's something that's is very, very hot. But over the last couple of, of months, and if you've been at the ANM, uh, you've probably seen that terbium is, is, is getting very, very strongly increasing interest, actually, at the moment, the, the 161, because it, it could technically probably uh, replace the lutetium fairly quickly, also to the fact that you have the Swiss knife, so uh, the other terbium isotopes that are of interest. Um, in terms of chemistry, um, so the production is pretty much the same for both. For the non-carriated version, you take a rich targets, put them in the reactor, you radiate. Um, usually fairly large targets, a couple of hundred milligrams. Um, at the moment, we're rather getting questions for like one gram or so, so looking into the, the upscale. 
and uh, optimizing the, uh, the recycling. Uh, one of the things we've been doing in, in that context is looking into providing pre-packed uh, polypropylene columns. Um, they start to be available, so you see a couple of examples. Um, got some color coding going on. Um, we have them in a couple of different uh, different sizes, um, from fairly large, the 75 mil, to the smallest one is 29 mil. So that's something that's coming onto the market uh, slowly. The connector is a uh, one fourth uh, inch 28G, and you can typically use them up until like 10 bar. You can get a bit, high, a bit higher, but for, for security reasons, probably tend to stand at about uh, 10 bar. Uh, and each of the column is going to be delivered with the C of A. Um, just the main parameter we're tracking is beaker symmetry to make sure that the uh, the packing has been done uh, properly. properly. Um, the get to one also, but this one's dry packed, so there's no no, uh, no extra. You see, this is really just a, a trap and release type of, of resin in that application. Um, yeah, so basically, the uh, we focus kind of pushed our focus more on the TK211, 12, 13. Uh, type of resins the last couple of, of months. It's still working with the same type of extractants, just we mix them up a little bit to, to gain a bit of selectivity here. Uh, a couple of other uh, tweaks to, to the resins, mainly to get them more radiously stable, but the general idea is, is still they're based on, on this kind of, of extractants. Um, I actually explained it last year already, so I don't want to, to, to get like too much time on that. Um, we've really been looking to sequential separations uh, to try to facilitate the automatization of the separation. So basically, you see that all three of them have high selectivity. Uh, there are some differences, but at the end of the day, selectivity is a pretty, pretty good for all three of them. Main difference is really the acidity. So what you can imagine in ideal case, which at the end of the day didn't really work out, but was necessary for the tabium, you can load at a very low acid concentration, for example, LN3. Um, eludes somewhere in the reach of 10, 20 to 30, a K prime of 20 to 30. That's why typically doing chromatographic separations uh, directly on a less, uh, more high uh, acidic resin, like the LN2. Again, uh, after loading, go into the 20, 30 uh, K prime region to do a, a chromatographic separation, um, elude your, your final product onto, for example, LN or the TK211 in that case for the final separation and then uh, then illusion. So at the end of the day, trying to, to, to profit from the fact that you have a couple of different uh, selective uh, molecules, resins, um, that you can basically use sequentially. Um, lutetium, that's a bit more tricky. At some point, so the, the, the LN3 didn't really work that straight. And at some point, um, it's been a bit too long. But for the tabium, actually, it was working quite uh, quite nicely, so it's a fairly straightforward uh, separation for 500 micron gadolinium targets. Um, so typically, you end up with um, the soft oxide target, fairly high nitric acid concentration. For the separation, as we've seen before, you need the dilute acid. So typically, we use the TK2 to one resin. It it allows to elude the the, the lanthanides typically in, in a smaller volume, so you gain uh, in volume compared to the DGA resin. Uh, we do a, a sequential separation. Don't show that again uh, then later. Then the final step, just a pre-concentration on TK2 to 1, uh, illusion in uh, dilute HCl, and then just go through a, a onion exchange cartridge just to be sure that you remove last traces of nitrate. So that's a typical separation that you would get. Um, so it's a relative recovery. Uh, that's pretty much the, the, the problem. The, the very high amount of gadolinium means that you get a very, very, very strong tailing, which is very problematic for the lutetium separation. Still doable, but uh, more complicated than here. You see here, if you choose the right conditions, you can let the tail out in a way, um, then still get a clean separation of the of the tabium. You can even separate it cleanly from the dysprosium, which is, at the end of the day, something that's, that's uh, requested. Um, so yeah, you can get a very clean separation here. Uh, ideally, you would do that on a radiation detection, so online, uh, cut out the diffraction and really just uh, elude this fraction onto the next column, um, which would in this case be directly at TK211 uh, in our example. Uh, that's been a, a 29 milliliter column. Uh, under these conditions, basically the catalin is breaking through. You still want to recover that. It's very expensive, um, but you can 
I watch through, remove the rest with 0.5 mononitric acid. Again, I collect all of the gadolinium on the site for recycling. Then elute the deuterium, two options. Uh, typically, in the first separation, you remove the dysprosium good enough, well enough. So there's no need to do an additional separation here. Um, so no need to do the elution in 0.75 mononitric acid still. If you want to have something ultra pure with respect to dysprosium in other higher, uh, heavy uh, REs, uh, you can still do that. In real life, it's, it's easier at that point to switch directly to 3.5 molar nitric acid. You loot in a very small volume directly on the ticket to, to one. Uh, you gain time. It, it improves the, the retention, the ticket to, to one. And you could take a product of, um, of really high purity. And the, the chemical yield is uh, it's really quite excellent, especially compared to, uh, to the lutetium separation. So it's a, it's a very nice system, actually, the, uh, the tablet separation. Okay, uh, TK400 again. Uh, that's been a topic a couple of times, and I'm, I'm getting back to, to iron a little bit because that's a, a small uh, project we had on the site with a with a different group. So basically, indeed, you can use the TK400 to remove um, a really quite large amount of different uh, elements. Uh, a couple of elements still are retained. It's iron, neop, molybdenum, typically, uh, same polonium, gallium. But in that special case, it's more from the from the decommissioning side of of application. Uh, that's really more a question of of, of getting iron, niob, niobium, and molybdenum separated uh, and measured later on. So basically, you can use the TK400 to remove the bulk, and you need to stay within the capacity of the of the resin, which is going to be one of the, the big challenges in in decommissioning, I guess. Um, elute and dilute HCl. You can directly uh, elute on the cell resin, um, so all three are going to be uh, retained. Then you can uh, recover iron in the tumor like GL, diluting um, quite, quite nicely. Neopium is diluted in oxalic acid, uh, 0.5 molar, so fairly, uh, fairly high concentration. And then you can recover molybdenum in six molar nitric acid. Um, going to contain a bit of organic matter. You might, uh, depending on what you use for, for quantification, you might need to, uh, to look into that. But in general, a couple of other applications of the TK400 is really to just remove niobium and, and iron, but really niobium from uh, from zirconiums in general, or plutonium-241. Uh, so just to, to take out any interference in LSC measurements of the plutonium-241 that might arise from the niobium-23. Um, in, in, in terms of zirconium, so zirconium-93 in decommissioning samples, especially when you look into ISP measurement, uh, you need to do a very, very thorough separation of zirconium and niobium, something that's at the moment and the development, especially with the Supertech group at, at Nantes. Uh, it's a mixed method that's uh, using UTIVA and, uh, and TK400. That's looking quite promising actually so far. And uh, some work, but I think I've spoke about it last time already, is uh, if, you, if you're separating zirconium-89 uh, using TBP resin, you do get some, uh, some, some iron and, and niobium potentially following in zirconium. If you just put a TK400 TK cartridge up front, you take these out directly and you get a, a much cleaner zirconium product. Something that's been, well, the first mention was actually by, by William uh, in 2019. It's using TK400 for gallium separation, gallium 68, uh, from solid zinc targets. Um, that is something that's actually really quite, quite elegant. And um, a bit like for the, the other gallium and the copper, uh, that was taken by, by Johan and, and Katie and, and really pushed uh, further uh, for fairly large scale uh, Solid zinc target chemistry. So they're using the, the TK400 for the, the separation of uh, gallium 68 from the, the solid, solid uh, zinc targets. Uh, they find that the elution is actually faster, smaller volumes uh, compared to the zirconium resin, makes the whole thing faster. The elution, uh, the, the, the flow rate uh, is, is faster. So overall, it looks like a very promising system actually for that application. Um, they stick to, to uh, another A. Aids on an exchange and TK200 for the removal of additional impurities and to allow, uh, again, to very smoothly and very, very thoroughly control the pH of the final product, mainly to, uh, to the use of, of, of suitable rinsing steps on the uh, TK200. So that's a, it's a new publication that's actually quite exciting. That's a very nice chemistry, actually. Okay, some of the upcoming stuff. Um, so this is this is going to come. I'm talking about that in some some time. But 
So we're actually already fairly good in, in terms of uh, producing the, the resins, uh, the, the discs, no resins this time. It's impregnated membrane filters, uh, at least on the R&D level. So this is going to, uh, to migrate into the production uh, soon. Um, advantage of, of this kind of membranes is higher flow rates, obviously. And I think that the real good application is, is with water samples. So when you need to pre-concentrate an analyte, for example, from, from, uh, from one five uh, liter water samples, you just gain, gain speed. Um, actually, the main application right now, that's actually fairly routine, is used in, in passive sampling. So basically put it in a passive sampling in each T device. Just put the, uh, the diffusive layer on top of that. After the exposure, uh, just take off the, uh, the diffusive layer, take the disc, elute it, and then do your separation or mass spec. So that's actually something that, that has become uh, fairly routine. And Stefan Wagner talked about that the last year already. Um, so that's getting a bit more uh, used a bit more often. Um, otherwise, so that's the, the TK100 for zirconium lead. And additionally, uh, uh, zinc now in a, in a new uh, collaboration. Um, we're working on Ticket 101. It's mainly for lead, looking to radium a bit, but uh, really that's something we've seen in the past that's working really quite nicely for, for lead. So idea being taking like one to five liter of, of one metal water sample, acidify to pH two, uh, load to the resin, rinse off the, some of the interference, and then uh, take up the disc and put in the LSC cocktail and measure. So that's something that uh, the method development and the testing is in the late stage, I would say, so that should be happening fairly soon. Um, already done for the chlorine resin. Um, that is so the silver loaded chlorine resin membrane filter, in a way, at least for radioiodine. This is working very nicely so far. So, as a, a rapid method for, for radioiodine in, in environmental samples, for example, uh, this looks uh, already quite promising. Having a bit trouble with chlorine 36, um, so we still need to see about that, but at least for radioiodine. Um, that's looking uh, already pretty, pretty good. Uh, and the next one is ticket to one. So that's really more on the technetium uh, type of application. And again, uh, method development is uh, is ongoing. Looking at a couple of others, calixarines typically for radium, for cesium, getting back to that a little later. So the support itself is actually quite, uh, quite convenient. The capacity is really quite, uh, quite impressive, mechanically stable. So what we're trying at the moment to us is to uh, to recut them into shape, um, try to get them on some kind of, of solid support, like a plastic stick or something, and then uh, use this, this impregnated membrane as the basis of a, uh, of a test stick. So the idea would really to be to, uh, to put a stick like uh, Alex has, has shown last year in at the last year's uh, UGM, um, to, to use that for rapid testing. So the, uh, the first test looked uh, pretty good. I think we found that the tweak to uh, to to get that working needs some some activation, but at the end of the day, there's something that uh, starts to to take form. Uh, where we really now need to look into how do we fix that on a on a test stick, for example. So that's something that, uh, especially in in terms of uh, decommissioning, rapid testing, emergency, that's something I I find quite quite interesting, and that's also something that might. Uh, getting back to to the work from Alex uh, from from University of Barcelona, using some kind of support as actually a plastic scintillator uh, for rapid testing, um, that could be quite quite sweet actually. So that's something we would really like to look into uh, in, in any case. Um, besides that, we're still working a bit on on well, there are the DJA sheets right now. We start to prepare uh, different kind of sheets, different kind of extractants, different type of supports. And a couple of other things that are not necessarily resins, but I don't want to spoil the fun this for next year, I would say. Okay, so other upcoming, so this is really upcoming that's uh, going to come next year. Uh, we've been talking about it since um, some time. We've been doing some additional work, and we feel that we have enough interest to uh, to actually get that uh, on the market, the TK300. Uh, Microcycle based resin, cesium, mostly, but it's also uh, working for rubidium. Um, that's data actually from from then from NPL. Uh, we use data a lot actually. Um, so in HCN3 and HCL, uh, high selectivity of other stuff, especially when looking into mass spectrometry applications, uh, cesium uh, selectivity of barium is very very high, which is uh, quite helpful. Uh, selectivity is so you really 
tend to work at the somewhat lower acid concentration, but still you can quite comfortably still uh, take up cesium from something like one molar nitric acid. And again, not much else really taken up uh, from the, on, the, on the resin. In terms of activity, it's a fairly good one. Uh, a couple of solution studies, but that's still something we were working on. So basically, you can either start from a water sample, so acidified water samples. You should have one step with a one molar nitric acid to, to get rid of stuff like if there is any sodium, for example, so just to make sure that you remove anything else. Um, then you tend to elude, you can elude cesium and rubidium separately. It's not something we ever had any questions on, but it, it's technically possible. But generally, in order to elude, you need fairly strong nitric acid. It's not, not ideal, but in this case, it is, uh, it is as it is. Uh, if you look into a cesium 135 by LSC, you could still look into um, uh, rinsing off, uh, wash with water, uh, try and then push the resin into a vial. Um, the bit uh, Tiva resin style with the Tiva columns. So that's, that's possible. But we are looking into using uh, preparing TK300 membrane filters. Uh, so that would be more in, in the sense of concentrating, rinsing off, and then rolling up and putting LSC, uh, LSC coater. But probably the, the, the more important application here is uh, cesium 135 uh, by, uh, by mass spectrometry. There's a couple of limitations. The, the capacity for cesium is fairly limited. Uh, there's a difference by potassium, which, which limits its use at the end of the day when it comes to environmental samples. So it limits to very small environmental samples. We really see that rather as a resin that is suitable for decommissioning samples. That's, uh, that's where the, the best of testing has, has been, been pointing to uh, so far. Um, so that's going to be uh, um, available sometime in the beginning, the uh, first half, let's say, of, um, of next year. Again, if you would like to test, please just uh, send an email. We uh, very gladly send samples out of, out of that. Um, some other resins that are under development that should uh, be available next year. Uh, TK102, um, modified version of the Johnson resin again. Uh, so there's a test logic between the TK100, 101, 102. Uh, not my proudest moment calling the resins like that, but uh, there is some logic to that. Um, so it is based again on the Johnson resin uh, crown heater. Uh, we've been playing around with, with different solvents, uh, different inner supports, tweaking the ratios a little bit, uh, not too much. And that at the end of the day, it seems, seems to end up in having K primes for lead for strontium in it and not for barium. It is something in, in the region of about 50% higher than, than standard strontium. And at least for lead, we still need to test strontium. We also seem to gain a, a good deal of capacity. Again, seems to be in the 50% uh, uh, region, but that's something that we still need to, to, um, to, to confirm a little bit. But overall, um, uh, the, the, the tweaking seems to have been fairly, uh, uh, fairly successful, uh, really. So at the moment, we're just going through methods and try to apply the TK102 uh, to the, the standard strontium uh, methods. Um, that's going to take a bit of time just to verify that, that it's working. Um, it does so far. There might be a little bit uh, more volume needed for dilution. So that's something that we still need to, uh, to, to, to look into. One of the things really that we, we mainly look into is, is using this one in the Swanson 82 production and then combining it with the TK100 to obtain at the end of the day a Swanson 82 from rubidium samples in, in fairly uh, dilute HCL, uh, no nitrates in a fairly uh, low volume. So that's a quite interesting uh, ongoing work. Uh, TK-222, that's really specific. I mean, there's, there's really only very few applications for that. Uh, we've seen that the TK-221 is, is having a couple of, of interesting properties. So uh, it, is, it is quite interesting. But we try to extend that to the TH, uh, DGA version, really mainly looking uh, to understand if, if this is bringing any additional value to the to actinium, especially actinium 2 to 5 uh, separation and to scanium separations. So the resin is ready now. We're just going through the uh, through the different uh, separations we'd like to we'd like to test. Again, if there's something you'd like to better test, one or two is maybe a little bit too early. If you come back to us in a couple of of weeks, we could probably be would be in a position to send the samples for better testing. Uh, take two to two. I think we have something ready uh, uh, for testing already. For us, very valuable. I mean, actinium chemistry we can't really do here. So anyone who would be interested in looking to that. 
uh, would be more than welcome. I'd be very happy to to share samples. Yeah, this is uh, this is a very big one, very exciting one uh, for us. Uh, we've been getting uh, increasingly requests from mostly hydrometallurgy. Um, so um, let's say more the industrial kind of scale use of our resins. Um, so uh, recycling, recovery of critical metals, for example, is typically in the lanthanide uh, kind of region. So a different uh, cover of different different projects. Um, so that's something we've been working on, we're still working on. Um, we do see other possible applications in the, the decontamination and valorization of affluents, especially radioactive contaminated or uh, contaminated waste that is decontaminated and then uh, looking to is there any way to get any uh, any of the uh, of something that could be of value in the, the decontaminating asset or just straightforward decontaminate. So that's really trying to to to, to get away from only using the, the resins in, in analytical and small scale uh, pharmaceutical applications, try to use them also in, in a larger scale, uh, working on a couple of different resins. And the, the real question is mostly larger beads. So instead of using uh, the usual between 20 and let's say 150 or 200 micrometer, at least 400 to 600 micrometer um, cheap. So there's a, there's a cutoff uh, or trade off in a way to the quality and then the pricing. That one. And then the real challenge right now is, is to find supply of the, the extractants in a, let's say in a suitable uh, quality that's sufficient. Um, very difficult to get very high purity extractants that, that kind of uh, of quantities. Um, the same for the supports. Uh, we really need to find uh, the good compromise in that kind of applications between the pricing and the uh, the, the quality. For us, it, it changed a little bit. The amount of resins that would need to produce this is fairly large. So at the moment, we, uh, for this kind of project, we're increasing our production uh, capacity. So if that, that kind of field is, is of interest for you, uh, please just uh, shoot me an email. That's probably one of my last uh, last slides. Um, but you've seen that we work with, with many, many groups, and that's something we really like to do. Uh, we very much love uh, developing some methods, but we really need people often to finish, to work hard. Uh, with, with the radioactivity, um, just give resin samples so that you can figure out is it working or is not. Um, so one one additional, well, it's more like an officialization of a cooperation we have been having since quite some time. It's something that's called the Common Virtual Laboratory, which is financed by the French ANR. It's called Tesmarac. Um, that's with Supertech, which is like 100 kilometers from here. Uh, and Triscam, Aronax is a little bit in there too, but really mostly Supertech. And we do get additional support from uh, from another group from the University of Mons uh, that is really specialized in molecular modeling. And that's something that we're looking to, especially uh, one topic that's really of interest for us since a long time. That's uh, well, because it's quite a lot of since, since a long time. It's radium separation. So they, the idea is they, they help us to, to be more efficient in terms of looking what kind of microcycles are efficient for radium separation. Um, try to avoid making too many synthesized too many FTs. So just pushing us in, in right directions and, and how the, the radium separation can be further improved compared to what we have uh, now. Uh, main focus, I mean that that's really our part: the uh, new resins, support materials, and, and using old ones uh, for new separations and pre-concentration methods. Uh, a lot of work is going to be done on DTM, and again, we can do the resins, we can work on methods, but we can't get any waste samples or any samples that actually contain DTMs. So part of the work is going to be done uh, at Supertech. Uh, waste material recycling, that's getting back a bit to the, the previous slide, uh, looking to how to use that. Uh, assessment of impact of radioactivity on human being. Well, radium is a, is a very big topic of, uh, of this, uh, this cooperation. Um, quite a lot of work on DGT. In general, uh, DGT, so passive sampling, is, is something that uh, well, same as, as last year, it's growing, uh, seeing growing interest in that and growing number of corporations. So this is, uh, is one more. And right to nuclear production for medical purpose. That's really mostly as the time to 11. Uh, and more specifically, it is more the radon to 11, radon to 11, uh, as the time to 11 uh, generator. So that's uh, an additional 
again, a cooperation we've been having for a long time. It's just been officialized and, uh, and sponsored by the French uh, INR. Okay, some other ongoing projects. Um, a small a small sample of, of, of what we're looking to. Actinum separation, I didn't look into that, uh, present on that too much. We're quite a lot of of, of uh, projects on actinium separations in in various ways. So not only on the production, but also purification of our final product, stuff like that. Radium always been a, a very important one. Selenium resin, that's another white whale that uh, that we're working on, and continue to work on. Um, OG emitters seem to get quite a lot of attention at the moment in, in nuclear medicine. So we do have a couple of of, of, of corporations on that and still interested to, to look into that further. Uh, for a number of reasons, we we'll continue to look into the improvement of red list stability, uh, also with respect to uh, strontium-82. Uh, rapid tests, uh, emergency situations, decommissioning, very interesting topic. Uh, also in field concentrations, so using resin cartridges or membranes directly in the field, instead of taking back one liter of, of sample, just take back uh, a cartridge uh, for analysis in, in laboratories. So that's something we get questions on uh, more often. Again, HT. Start to look a bit into microfluidics, DTMs, still a very, very big topic for us. And uh, looking into this whole decondition and valorization topic a little bit more. So plenty of things that are interesting us. Um, there is more, but uh, in any case, if any of these is of interest, or if you have any other separation that you need or anything you, you would like to tackle as a as R&D project, please always feel free to, to contact me. I'm always more than happy to uh, to look into that kind of corporations. With that, I thank you for your attention. And I'm open for questions, if there are any. Okay, yeah, so are there any questions at the moment? Yeah, Ben. Hi, Steph, thank you very much. Well, that's very interesting. Um, I think the, there's a couple of things you mentioned that are very interesting from the nuclear medicine side. Um, there's a, a Horizon 2020 project called Prismap that started in May that you might have come across from some of the people that you work with, but um, so from the radiochem side, I think the things you mentioned around the Terbium 161 um, and, uh, and also the platinum separation, I think, um, is is very interesting and and you mentioned in the last slide the OJ emitters so those those three really did stick out for the terbium work um we uh, had a phd student ben webster who spent a lot of time based on ln resin separation for terbium 155 and that he uh, got a nice sort of separation in place but um yeah so looking at these other resins as a comparison would be Certainly interesting from from our side as part of that as part of that project. So it's more a comment. Thanks for just to say thanks for raising it. I think that's yeah, and uh, for us it would be would be uh, very interesting. Tabium is indeed something we get an increasing number of questions on. Right now, mostly Tabium is one six one, but uh, generally, yeah, Tabium is is gaining a lot of traction. Okay. Last, last year, I completely did not respect my talking time. I'm sorry about that. Um, so if there are no further questions, again, thank you very much to NPL, Ben, for organizing, uh, to all presenter for, for being so kind to, to share your work, uh, for the participant to, to sticking around and, and the interesting discussion, the interesting questions. And yeah, if there are no other remarks or questions, um, I close the, uh, I close our